Turning to differences in maturity, we start from the observation that interest rates on the same type of bond, like for instance a treasury bond, can also vary across maturities. For instance, this graph illustrates the yield curve for US treasuries as of October 5, 2020. A yield curve is the most common tool to illustrate a term structure and plots different maturities, here on the x-axis, against the respective yields, here on the y-axis. For instance, the Treasury on, in early October paid about 0.1% on a one-month bond or a two-month bond, while they paid about 06 on a 10-year bond. Now, generally speaking, such yield curves can have the three different shapes. They can slope upward, which is what we refer to as a normal yield curve. They can slope downward, which is sometimes referred to as an inverted yield curve, or they could simply be flat. In reality, the relationship across the maturity spectrum is very linear, so often we see kinked or humped yield curves. We will briefly discuss why yield curves look the way they do before we move on to the question why financial practitioners and economists care about yield curves. Um, before we can do so, let me start with three stylized facts, though. First things first, yields tend to move together over time. That is, if short-term yields rise, long-term yields tend to rise as well. Much like when short-term yields fall, long-term yields fall also. We will talk about why this is, but this kind of core movement among interest rates is something we already saw in the context of the risk structure of yields. Didn't point it out much there, but if you go back to that graph that compared, for instance, the triple B to high yield bonds, you'll notice that interest rates tend to trend in the same direction, and the same is true for the term structure of interest rates. The second observation sounds slightly more contradictory to the first, but in reality it is, and I'll clarify in a second. The first states that interest rates tend to all move in the same direction at the same time. The second empirical fact that we observe about interest rates is one about relative distance of yields. Specifically, when short-term yields are low, long-run interest rates are relatively high, and when short-term rates are high, long-term yields are relatively low. What this means in reality is that the slope of the yield curve varies depending on what short-term yields are. When short-term yields are high, the yield curve tends to be flat, whereas when short-term yields are low, the yield curve tends to be relatively steep. The third empirical fact, finally, is easy to understand. Yield curves tend to always slope upward. That means long-term yields tend to be higher than short-term yields. Now, I'm not going to show you the empirical evidence at this point. That will be part of the homework assignment. But for now, just accept these three facts. Yields tend to co-move. When short-term yields are low, interest rates, sorry, yield curves tend to be steep. And number three, yield curves almost always slope upward. There are three ways to explain the shape of yield curves. With the first two that are listed here, building the foundation for the more modern approaches, which are the third ones here. Um, these are one, the pure expectations theory, which explains both co-movement and yield curve steepening and flattening, but it cannot account for the fact that yield curves normally slope upward. The second theory we'll briefly discuss is the segmented market theory, which explains that latter effect that yield curves are always upward sloped, but cannot account for the first two. And then finally, the liquidity premium and preferred habitat theory, which are a combination of the first two, explain all three empirical facts. Let's begin with the expectations theory. The core idea here is that long-term yields are an average of expected short-term yields. What does that mean? For instance, if you expect the average one-year yield to equal 10% over the next five years, then today's five-year yield should also equal 10%. The key assumption herein is that investors only care about the combination of maturities that pay the highest expected yields and otherwise do not care about maturities at all. In equilibrium then, based on arbitrage condition, this yields an outcome where all average interest rates need to equal each other. Now, since this might be a little bit abstract, let's illustrate this using an example. Say for instance, you wish to invest over a period of two years and you have two choices to do so. One, you buy a one-year bond, you hold it to maturity, and then use the proceeds to buy another one-year bond, which you hold to maturity again until two years from now. 
The second option, sometimes the simpler one, is you buy a two-year bond today and collect interest on this bond twice. As always, for the sake of illustration, we assume that there are no transactions cost or similar complications that could induce frictions into this choice. Now, according to the pure expectations theory, the average expected yield on these two strategies should be identical. Well, again, what this means, if the one-year interest rate today is 5% and you expect the one-year interest rate next year to be 10%, then the interest rate on a two-year bond today should be 7.5%. If one strategy or the other promises a higher yield, investors should only follow that strategy which would of course drive up the price of the involved bonds, therefore reducing the yields through arbitrage. Let's formalize this a little bit more by first introducing some basic notation. Let IT be the interest rate on a one period bond today and IT plus one E be the expected yield on a one period bond one year from now. Of course, by the time you make the decision, you only know what today's interest rates are. You don't know what tomorrow's interest rates are gonna be, so you have to form an expectation. Finally, let I2T be the interest rate on a two-year bond you buy today. So that is something you know again. Now, what is the interest you earn for each dollar invested if you hold a two-year bond that you buy today to maturity. If you invest $1 in a two-period bond, you receive interest twice. This formula is familiar. This is simply our standard future value calculation from before. First interest payment, and then you accrue interest on the second interest payment as well. To get a per dollar amount, we simply subtract the initial investment. So this is just interest paid on $8. We can expand this expression, which yields the expression over here, one plus two i two t plus i two t squared minus one. Uh, the ones cancel out, and what you're left with is two i two t plus i two t squared. Now, what this is in essence saying is that if you invest one dollar in a two-year bond today, you earn twice its interest rate. That's straightforward. And then there's a cross term here which accounts for the interest you earn on the interest you've made in the first period. Now, for shorter time horizons, this is gonna be very, very small. If the interest rate is 2%, this would be 2% of 2%. So for the sake of our discussion, we're gonna ignore this cross term here. So approximately, if you buy a two-year bond, what do you make? You make two times the interest rate. It pays 2i2t. There's a two missing here. Sorry about that. Now, by contrast, what do you earn if you purchase a one-year bond, use the proceeds, and reinvest? Again, on your initial dollar, you earn interest, one plus IT. Then you reinvest this amount at whatever you think tomorrow's one-year interest rate is gonna be, which again, you don't know today. Subtracting one, again, gives you the expected interest payment for each dollar invested. Again, I can expand this expression. It's gonna look similar to the other one. The ones are going to cancel here. What I'm left with here is that what I make if I invest into one-year bonds is the interest rate on the one-year bond today. The interest, bond, I th the interest rate I think a one-year bond is going to pay tomorrow, and then a cross term here that accrues for accounting for compounding. The compounding term again is going to be fairly close to zero, so we ignore it. In other words, if you buy two one-year bonds, the expected interest rate you earn is the one-year interest rate today plus the expected one-year interest rate tomorrow. Now, no arbitrage assumes that both of these interest rates need to be the same. Solving this expression for the long-term rate, which in this case is the two-year rate, yields I2T is equal to the short-term rate today plus the expected short-term rate tomorrow divided by two. And this, of course, is simply the average of these two rates. That's what the expectations theory states. If we don't care about anything other than what pays the higher interest rates, long-term interest rates in equilibrium need to be an average of short-term. 